Welcome to week two. All right, so we're going to uh, take a look this week at making arguments. Uh, and we're looking here at the basis of how you're going to uh, start out thinking about your argument and what the uh, rhetorical basis of it is going to be. Okay, so let's take a look. All right. To make an effective argument requires an examination of the issue close enough so that you understand it well enough. Research is key, okay? You can't just be going off half-cocked and uh, finding a way to argue something where you don't have enough argument to support the, or you don't have enough evidence to support the argument. So you are going to be required to do at least a little bit of research, okay? Or to be quite honest, it's going to wind up being a lot of research, okay? <clears throat> Once your research is complete, though, there are four main tasks to perform in order to create a good argument. Uh, one of them is to develop a main argument appropriate for the rhetorical situation, okay? So look at all the elements of your rhetorical situation, uh, who you're writing for, what the environment is, what the circumstances are that you are writing into, okay? Uh, and use that as factors for how you're going to approach your argument. Uh, make an appeal likely to be persuasive to your intended audience. So what's going to appeal to them in a way that they're going to understand and that they're going to accept, okay? Uh, support your claim with appropriate evidence and or reasoning. Uh, you need to do the research, do the legwork, find the facts that back up whatever reasons you have for arguing whatever it is that you are arguing. And then fourth, adopt a format and style appropriate to the rhetorical situation and medium. Okay, uh, However you're going to put your argument forth, whatever you're going to do to put forth that argument, that is what we're talking about here. Okay. <clears throat> now, as a writer, you must have something to say. Exploration of the topic will help you to develop your main argument, but this is not the same as your position on the issue. Now, we do have an example of this process uh, in the textbook. It is in Chapter 11, uh, where Yagelsky will show you the progression to the main argument going through four parts. That part, those parts being, one is the topic. What are you writing about? Second, the problem. What needs to be fixed or what questions are there about the topic? Third is your position. How do you feel about the problem? And fourth is your main argument. What practical, actionable position can you take on the problem that aligns with your position? Now, just briefly, let's take a look at the example that Yagelsky gives you in the textbook. All right, so the example that Yagelsky gives you uh, is a uh, four-tiered approach to an essay, or an argument essay about campus security, okay? So first off, we have our topic there. Our topic is campus security. Uh, second, problem or question. Does the campus need new security measures for dormitories to protect students? Uh, this is actually really important for a lot of college campuses, especially when we get back to going face-to-face, -face, as a lot of students live on campus and there are going to be security concerns. Uh, it's actually concerns that I've lived with. I actually have had stuff stolen from me from dorm rooms, okay? Uh, and that requires some security uh, that probably was partly my fault because I was too tired and forgot to lock my door, but also you do have to have some element of security there, especially because you have a lot of people collected together in one place and there's not good guarantee that everybody is just as moral as you are. Okay? So, <clears throat> topic campus security, problem or question, does the campus need to do security measures for dormitories to protect students? Third part, your position. How do you feel about it? You are opposed to proposed campus security policies. Okay? Uh, this is, in this case, we're dealing with a campus that is starting to, is going to enact more restrictive security policies. Okay? Uh, maybe they're requiring a lot of ID checks. Maybe they're doing some lockdowns, something like that. Okay? That gets us to the fourth part of this, which is the main argument. Proposed security measures will restrict students unnecessarily without improving the safety of the dorms. Okay? So, ultimately, the argument that's being made here is uh, you're making us live in a police state. Why? 
because it's not going to increase our security any better. Okay, so uh, this is the four stage process that you're going to be using for most arguments. Okay, find out what your topic is, what the problem is within that topic, compose a position on that topic, and then get to your main argument. Okay. All right, so uh, here comes your first exercise for this week, okay? Uh, you can do this in your journal. I'm not going to make you guys post this, okay? Uh, but basically what I want you to do is take go further down on that, chap that section of the chapter, okay? Uh, it's under exercise 11C. And I want you to start thinking about an argument of your own, okay? There are three exercises there. In fact, I'll re-show them to you here. Uh, these are the three exercises. Uh, just as a summary, here is what they are. Uh, number one, identify three issues that you feel strongly about and write a brief paragraph about each one, explaining your position. Describe a main argument you might make supporting that position. Uh, number two, find two or three arguments about the same topic preferably on different sides. Write a brief synopsis of each one, including a statement of the writer's main argument, then compare the arguments and look at how each writer takes a stance and develops their argument. Okay? Uh, then you have the third one. Think of two or three changes you would like to see at your campus or workplace. Then write a letter to your college president, principal, or boss to argue in favor of the changes, developing a main argument for each change. Okay. Uh, we're going to take 20 minutes for this exercise, so uh, choose one of the options and perform the action requested, okay? Uh, if you ha have contact with your team, you can actually ask them for help uh, for this exercise, but uh, I might recommend just sticking with your own guns on this and think about what you personally would want to write about, okay? So let's take about 20 minutes here and uh, develop your main argument.
All right, yeah, we're back. All right. So what we're going to talk about now is considering the rhetorical situation, which is also going to play into how you're going to approach your argument. Okay. Now, recall the work that you did in Composition 1 in regards to rhetorical situations, okay? Uh, remember the considerations that we had to take into, take into account for any kind of writing. These concepts equally apply to arguments. For instance, first off, what is your writing audience's pre-existing knowledge about the topic or situation? So you need to know what your audience knows already. What kind of expectations do they have? You'll need to account for the audience's pre-existing knowledge and biases for or against your position and or your particular argument. So you need to understand how your audience feels about the topic, how your audience is going to react to your argument. That's going to determine whether you are speaking to a friendly audience or possibly a uh, unfriendly audience, maybe somebody that's uh, automatically inclined to disagree with you. So keep that in mind. So first off, Audience's pre-existing knowledge. Second, what is the audience's interest or stake in the issue? How is it going to affect them? How does the argument affect the people you're directly addressing? Now, be sure that it does. Because you do not want to be writing an argument for an audience that does not have any interest in the subject matter. Okay, So make sure that it affects them, even if they may not realize it yet. So this is going to make things more challenging. You'll have to also argue that it does apply to them in addition to what solution works best for them. Okay, so make sure you understand how they're going to be affected by the argument. What kind of stakes are there for the audience themselves? Is it something that they may have already considered? Is it something that may they do not have a stake in? Or is it something that they have a stake in and they just may not know it yet? Okay. <clears throat> Third, what does your audience expect? So, on what side of the argument is your audience? Again, what kind of pre-existing knowledge do they have and what kind of uh, preconceived notions do they have about it? Are you approaching them as an ally or as an adversary? Your tone in the argument is going to be affected by your position in relation to them. So, what kind of language you use, what kind of terminology you use, okay? Uh, and the tone of your argument, the tone of writing that you use. You need to be, I will, I will say, as respectful as possible, especially to an adversarial audience. Because if you come out guns blazing, uh, telling them that they're stupid for not believing you, they're not going to be inclined to believe you. They're going to be inclined to turn, tune you out. Okay? Uh, to give you an example here, uh, let's... Think about, uh, well, let's see. Think, think about a situation where you've had to argue something difficult uh, for your parents, okay? Uh, what kind of expectations do they have? So they're, the, they're your parents, so you know them, hopefully. I would hope, okay? Uh, Account for their pre-existing knowledge, okay? What do they know about the situation that you're arguing over? What do they think about it, okay? What kind of, uh, how are they inclined to think about it, okay? What kind of stake do they have through you, okay? What kind of, what kind of stake do they have in the argument's outcome of whether you win or lose, okay? Also, what do they expect, okay? Are they going to be on your side, or are you expecting them to not be on your side? Okay. Uh, in which case, you're going to have to determine how you're going to move forward. Okay. Especially with language choices, uh, uh, there are some terms that you would use specifically for individual sides. Uh, example I like to use for this because it's the easiest, but unfortunately, it's also the most controversial. Is uh, terminology used by both sides of the abortion uh, debate, okay? So you have two sides of the abortion debate. You have pro-life and you have pro-choice, okay? Typically, how they refer to the opposition is going to determine uh, what side a writer uses, okay? What side a writer is taking, okay? Now, uh, typically, they're going to try, both sides are going to try to make themselves seem more positive uh, and the other side being more negative, okay? So, uh, 
you have pro-choicers who are going to, they're not going to refer to the opposition as pro-life. They're going to refer to the opposition in terms of such as anti-abortion. Okay? Okay. They're going to uh, refer to them maybe, uh, they're going one step further more recently, anti-women's health. Okay? Now, the other side of things, the pro-lifers, okay, uh, the pro-lifers are not going to call their opposition anti-life. Okay? Uh, they're not going to call them pro-choice either. They're just going to call them pro-abortion. -abor pro uh, or in extreme cases, they're going to call them murderers. Okay, so uh, this is what we're talking about with heated rhetoric. Okay, uh, there's the terminology is going to change depending on who the audience is uh, and what side the uh, what side the audience takes. So a writer is going to use the terminology specific for the side that he is speaking to. Okay. All right. Here's a question that some that comes up a lot when you deal with academic arguments. Do you have to win the argument? Okay. So just a reminder, the type of argument is not the same as an everyday argument, which is more akin to a fight than a discussion. Okay. So we're not dealing with a knockout, drag out, uh, knockdown, drag out, verbal fisticuffs here. Okay. Your argument does not necessarily have to be a winning argument in order to be influential. OK, uh, the main idea here is to advance the knowledge presented on the subject. That's the whole point of academic argument is to increase learning, increase understanding uh, to help an audience realize more about what the world around them and learn more maybe about their opposition. OK, now occasionally the goal is going to be to achieve common ground. So. Uh, in the next section of the chapter, Yagelsky presents a situation where arguments presented in a gun control argument can be reach common ground by finding a goal shared by all the participants. Okay, in this case, it's reducing violent crime. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here is the uh, focus uh, element of this chapter. Okay, do you have to win the argument? So, in theory, an effective argument persuades an audience to accept a proposition, adopt a position, or take a course of action. In reality, an argument can achieve its purpose without necessarily persuading readers to adopt the writer's position, especially when it comes to issues about which people have strong views. For example, imagine that your state legislature is considering a controversial ban on certain kinds of firearms. Citizens support or oppose the ban depending on their opinions about gun control. An argument against the ban is unlikely to change the minds of those who support it but it might influence the discussion. Because both supporters and opponents agree that lowering crime rates is desirable, an argument that the ban is likely to reduce violent crime would probably interest all parties in the debate. The goal is to contribute to the debate and influence how others think about the issue. Okay, that's the main key here. Okay, get people thinking. Get that information out there. Make your opinion known. So now the audience has one more thing to consider before coming to their knee-jerk decision. Okay. So let's do a brief exercise again about considering the rhetorical situation. Once again, this is going to be one that you can put in the journal. I'm not going to make you post this publicly. Okay. So just below that box we we're looking at, there's some continuations of the, there's more exercises uh, in regards to rhetorical situations. One of them is a continuation of the last one if you chose the particular question. Okay? So, once again, choose one option, complete that exercise. Once again, if you're in contact with your team, you can, uh, you can assist the others on your team and your team can assist you. Okay? So, first question here, this is a continuation of the last first question. Okay? Or question number one from the last set of exercises. Okay, so remember that one you were writing out uh, particular arguments about uh, certain topics. Okay, now for this one, look at those arguments that you previously composed and identify an appropriate audience for each argument. Who are, would you have to be talking to in order for that argument to be most effective? Okay, write a brief description of each receptive audience. So this time you'd be telling us who you would be speaking to. Okay. What kind of things would you be, what kind of people would you be wanting your argument to influence? All right. 
Second, find a published argument you agree with on a topic you care about and think about what it would require to rewrite that argument for a different audience. Okay, so now we're talking about shifting the audience. How are we going to get the same effect that this article had on you, only we're going to switch it to an audience that may not necessarily be you? It might be somebody in a different ethnic group. It might be somebody with a different set of politics, somebody different religion, any number of changes to that audience. You're going to have to determine how you're going to rephrase that argument to make it effective for that new group. Then we have number three. Think about writing about a controversial topic to an audience opposed to your position. Summarize your position on the topic, then summarize your opponent's position, and then finally identify some arguments that may appeal to the opposing audience to find common ground. Okay? So think about a controversial issue. Okay, something that's in the news, something that's going to cause a lot of, uh, I don't want to say upheaval, but I guess upheaval on both sides of the issue. People are going to have strong opinions about it. So I want you to try to look at the arguments on both sides, summarize them, and see where you can find some common ground between them. Okay. Once again, we're going to have you guys pause B for 20 minutes so that you can do this exercise. Okay, go ahead and do that now. element here is we to be talking about persuasion okay how do we go about making a persuasive appeal to try to get our audience on our side okay writers use persuasion to strengthen arguments classical arguments typically have three types of appeals okay these are all based on uh, terms from I believe either Greek or Latin I'm pretty sure it's Greek though okay so Starting from the top here, we have ethos, where arguments are based on the character of the speaker. 
Okay, so certain certain individuals are going to be more influential than others because of their experience, because of their credentials, because of who they are. Okay, uh, for example, uh, what I one example I have here is the Dalai Lama. Okay, uh, certain things that he certain topics that he discusses, especially on subjects such as uh, religious tolerance and. Uh, a lot of a lot of other issues in regards to uh, uh, making overtures toward world peace. Uh, he's going to be influential about that. He's going to have uh, a legitimate voice, and stuff that he says is going to be accepted as credible. Okay. Uh, then we have pathos. Pathos involves arguments appealing to the emotions. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but. Pathos is one of those types of appeals that has a tendency to get abused by certain individuals, uh, especially demagogues, uh, if they uh, overuse it. Okay, If they rely on appealing to emotions too much, it winds up becoming preying on emotions. Okay. Third one is Logos, where arguments are based in reason and evidence. This is the uh, galaxy brain argument where you are de appealing to the highest level of intellect that your audience has. Okay? So let's take a look at these particular appeals. Let's we'll start with the ethos appeal. Okay? This is a, these are appeals that are based on character. Okay? Any argument which claims legitimacy by way of a person presenting it is making an appeal to ethos. Okay? Uh... You're basing it based on your credentials. You're basing it based on your experiences. You're basing it based on your character. Okay? Your character as an individual influences this appeal. It's based on your accomplishments, position, angle of vision to the subject, matter, education, and any other personal influences which make you more qualified to present an opinion on that topic. Okay? So anything that qualifies you to be an expert, that is your ethos. Okay? So... Think about it, think about it in terms of this. Uh, if you're reading something in a med about a medical procedure or some kind of medical topic, uh, would you rather read something that comes from a medical doctor with 15 years experience, or would you rather read something from a high school dropout who fancies themselves a uh, Native American medicine man, even though they're white? You probably want to talk with a doctor, okay? So, the accomplishments and the credentials that you have as an individual uh, influence how your writing is approached by your audience, whether you're going to be seen as a credible source or not, okay? Now, we have two examples of credible arguments presented on the basis of ethos in the Yagelsky textbook. The two excerpts, one is by Barbara Ehrenreich and the other is by David Brooks. Okay, now uh, we're going to read through these. And I want to try to, as much as possible to skip the author's credentials as presented in the text. So I want you to think about how much credibility the excerpts have without the ethical content. Uh, and eventually, how much does the character of both Aaron Reich and Brooks add to the persuasiveness of their work? Okay, so we're going to take a look at the two excerpts right here uh, and then. For about five minutes, this is going to be one that gets posted to the discussion board. Uh, you guys are going to talk about uh, how uh, credible you believe those excerpts are without the author's credentials, and then following that with the author's credentials. All right, so here's the first one. This is Barbara Ehrenreich from a, uh article titled On Turning Poverty into an American Crime. Okay. At the time I wrote Nickel and Dimed, I wasn't sure how many people it directly applied to. Only that the official definition of poverty was way off the mark since it defined an individual earning $7 an hour, as I did on average, as well out of poverty. But three months after the book was published, the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. issued a report entitled Hardships in America, The Real Story of Working Families, which found an astounding 29% of American families living in what could be more reasonably defined as poverty meaning that they earned less than a bare-bones budget covering housing, child care, health care, food, transportation, and taxes. Though not, it should be noted, any entertainment, meals out, cable TV, internet service, vacations, or holiday gifts. 
29% is a minority, but not a reassuringly small one, as other studies in the early 2000s came up with similar figures. The big question 10 years later is whether things have improved or worsened for those in the bottom third of the income distribution. The people who clean hotel rooms, work in warehouses, wash dishes in restaurants, care for the very young and very old, and keep the shelves stocked in our stores. The short answer is that things have gotten much worse, especially since the economic downturn that began in 2008. Okay. Now here's the other article. This is the one from David Brooks. <clears throat> The New American Academy is led by Shimon Waronker, who grew up speaking Spanish in South America, became a U.S. Army intelligence officer, became an increasingly observant Jew, studied at Yeshiva, joined the Chabad Lubavitch movement, became a public school teacher, and then studied at the New York City Leadership Academy, which Mayor Michael Bloomberg and the former New York School's Chancellor Joel Klein founded to train promising school principal candidates. At first, he had trouble getting a principal's job because people weren't sure how a guy with a beard, kippah, and a black suit would do in overwhelmingly minority schools. But he revitalized one of the most violent junior high schools in South Bronx, and with the strong backing of both Klein and Randy Weingarten, the president of the teachers' union, he was able to found his brainchild, the New American Academy. He has a grand theory to transform American education, which he developed with others at the Harvard School of Education. All right, so uh, without the author's credentials, okay, I want you to talk about wh whether you believe those uh, assessment, those uh, uh, passages are credibly written, okay, whether you're inclined to believe that author or not, okay, uh, and then once you're done with that, take a look at the cred credentials that Yagelsky presents for them, because he'll tell you a little bit about them and then decide whether your assess initial assessment was correct or not, okay? Uh, let's take a five minutes here, and then we'll continue to the next one.
All right, we're back. All right, so the next, uh, eth the next uh, appeal we're going to talk about is the pathos appeal, which is appeals based on emotion. Okay, uh, this is the tuggy on the heartstrings appeal. Uh, we're going to try to make you feel something, and because you feel that way, you're going to think certain way about the topic I'm talking about. It's one of the riskiest types of persuasion because of the potential of abuse by the user. Playing upon your audience's emotions occasionally is okay. You want them to feel. They're human. They're going to have an emotional reaction. Okay? So you want them to feel something. Okay? Preying on the audience's sympathy in lieu of any kind of logical argument is not. Okay? So you do not want to use the pathos appeal as a substitute for any substantive argument you might want to give, okay? Uh, we're going to talk uh, later in the class about logical fallacies, but I wanted to introduce an element to you, uh, especially in regards to the pathos, uh, to the pathos appeal, okay? Uh, now, there was a, a while back, I was using a textbook that had an excerpt of an old short story from, I believe, the early 50s. Uh, it was titled, Love is a Fallacy. Okay, and uh, it was a really silly and really kind of sexist story because it involved a guy who was uh, at law school uh, and he was looking for a girlfriend because he wanted a trophy wife. Uh, and the girl he picked was the uh, biggest airhead he could find. And he decided he was going to turn her into a logician. That is to say he was going to teach her logic. So he spent night after night after night taking her on picnic dates where he would teach her about logical fallacies. One of the fallacies he taught her about and is directly related to this pathos uh, appeal uh, is a uh, fallacy that he called the ad misericordium fallacy, or uh, it's more commonly now known as the appeal to emotion. Okay? Uh, and it's, again, it's only a fallacy if you don't have any substance behind it. The example that he gave uh, of this fallacy was a man who goes in for a job interview. And when he's asked about what his qualifications are for the job, uh, he responds with uh, the fact that his family is starving, his uh, wife is destitute, he has not, he's been out of work for six months, and they are going to lose their house if he doesn't get a job. Okay, all well and good. Your life sucks, but that's, but does that really tell me why you're qualified to do this position? No, it doesn't. You don't have a substantive argument here. You're just asking me to feel sorry for you. So, that is a flawed argument right there. That's what we want to try to avoid when you're using pathos appeals. Okay? Keep in mind, human experience includes emotion. So a persuasive argument can use this to the arguer's advantage by making the audience feel like they need to agree with the argument on a purely emotional level. Sometimes you can grab them by the heart, okay, uh, and then get them by the brain. So maybe you need this to grab them first. There's two examples of pathos uh, appeals, okay, uh, in the Yagelsky textbook. Once again, we're going to read through them, and then this time I want you to respond to them uh, to the discussion board uh, by talking about the emotions that they evoke. Okay, how do you feel about the stuff that's being written about here? Uh, we have two examples here. One is from Jennifer Browdy de Hernandez, and the other one is from Kathleen Sebelius. This is the Browdy de Hernandez. Okay, let's take a look. Lately, I have been sitting with the brooding knowledge that at least 7 million migrating songbirds were killed this spring running the gauntlet of 84,000 American communication towers that rise as high as 2,000 feet into the sky, braced by invisible guy wires that garrot the birds right out of the air. This is actually just a fraction of the number of birds killed each year by running a collision course with human activity. This spring has been more silent than ever. The traditional dawn chorus of birdsong has ebbed to a few lonely little souls, most belonging to non-migratory species like cardinals, blue jays, chickadees, and sparrows. They say that when uh, Europeans first arrived on this continent, the migration of the pasture pigeons would literally darken the sky for minutes on end. I have never seen a living passenger pigeon, and it seems that my grandchildren will not know what I mean when I talk about the dawn chorus of riotously busy, happy birdsong, 
any more than they will be able to imagine an apple orchard in full bloom buzzing with the diligent harvest of a million droning bees. Knowledge like this makes me sick at heart. My rational side is aware that mourning is not productive, but another side of me knows that it is one of the special gifts of us humans to feel grief, to locate particular sadnesses in the larger landscape of suffering, and to use our sadness and anger at injustice as a lightning rod for change. Other animals and birds feel grief as well, but you won't find the great community of birds gathering together to make plans to topple all the communication towers in North America. No, the birds will go quietly, one by one, into the endless night of extinction. Alright, so here is the second one. This is the uh, one from Kathleen Sibelius, who is a former uh, Secretary, of House, uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. Okay? So, just so you know, she has the credentials to be talking about this. So, it's really short, but try to understand the emotion, try to think about the emotion she's trying to evoke here. Two years ago, President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act. The president's health care law gives hardworking, middle-class families security, makes Medicare stronger, and puts more money back in seniors' pockets. Prior to 2011, people on Medicare faced paying for preventive benefits like cancer screenings and cholesterol checks out of their own pockets. Now these benefits are offered free of charge to beneficiaries. Over time, the health reform law also closes the gap in prescription drug coverage, known as the donut hole. This helps seniors like Helen Rayon. I am a grandmother who is trying to assist a grandson with his education. I take seven different medications. Getting the donut hole closed, that gives me a little more money in my pocket. In 2010, those who hit the donut hole received a $250 rebate, with almost 4 million seniors and people with disabilities receiving a collective $1 billion. In 2011, people on Medicare automatically received a 50% discount on brand name drugs in the donut hole. Over 3.6 million beneficiaries received more than $2.1 billion in savings, averaging $604 per person last year. Right. So even though there's a lot of statistics there, there's still a little bit of emotional content. So I want you guys to discuss both of these excerpts uh, on the discussion board, uh, talk about what kind of emotions they evoke. Okay. Again, five minutes on this.
All right, and we're back. All right, so now we're going to talk about logos. This is the appeal that's based in reason and fact. Okay. This is really the should be the centerpiece of most classical argument. Okay. Uh, you're, it's okay to appeal to emotions. It's okay to ride on your credentials a bit, but most of your argument, the meat of it, uh, the big old T-bone steak of it, has to be your logic. Has to be your reasons. Has to be your evidence. Okay. What must be the basis for every well-reasoned argument? Logic is the rational structure for an argument. The factual reasonings why your argument is correct. Even if your argument relies mostly on emotional or ethical appeals, there has to be some element of logic to your argument. There has to be at least a little bit, okay? You can't just be going off uh, half-cocked with your logic. There has to be some reason why you think that way, all right? Now, there are two forms of logical appeal that you can work with in a classical argument. Uh, one of them is inductive reasoning. This is a conclusion that's drawn based upon factual evidence presented. Your argument conclusion in this case is based mostly in the facts you've researched and presented in favor of your argument. Now, this is how most people uh, really try to work uh, in terms of most research papers. Okay, They're going to uh, do the research first and then draw a conclusion based on that research. Okay, So to give you an example of inductive reasoning, let's take a look at uh, another excerpt that Yigelsky puts in. Uh, it's from an article titled College is Still Worth It by Mark Gieser-Gear. So here is the article. Recently, the Pew Charitable Trust came out with a report that supports what many of us have been saying to critics of higher education. While the system has its problems, by and large, those with college degrees are better off than those without them, even during the recent economic turmoil. The Pew report makes several basic points that should be mentioned anytime someone claims that higher education isn't a good investment. Although all 21 to 24 year olds experienced declines in employment and wages during the recession, the decline was considerably more severe for those with only high school or associate degrees. The comparatively high employment rate of recent college graduates was not driven by a sharp increase in those settling for lesser jobs or lower wages. The share of non-working graduates seeking further education did not change markedly during the recession. Out of work college graduates were able to find jobs during the downturn with more success than their less educated counterparts. These aren't trivial observations, and they now have even more statistical support than before. The general economic benefits of getting a degree are still pretty clear. That doesn't mean that any college degree plan is a good one, and any sensible approach to higher education, whether at the undergraduate or graduate level, should include a clear-eyed analysis of what one is likely to pay to and receive from a given school. It is simplistic and false to claim that more education always leads to more income or better job opportunities. It is also correct to point out that excessive student loan debt is a terrible burden that may not be justifiable for certain schools or fields of study. But that doesn't mean that it's good advice to tell young people who want to go to college and who are prepared to do so that they shouldn't do so because it's not worth the time or the price. Those with college degrees are still more likely to be employed than those without them, and their prospects aren't bleak. While the phrase caveat emptor is a necessary one to consider in picking colleges and degree programs, the Great Recession shouldn't claim the idea that higher education is a ticket to a better future as one of its victims. Okay? So this is an argument that's very much based in statistics and fact and reasoning. Okay? So look at all the reasons that he's presenting here, the evidence that he presents. Okay? Uh, he's trying to get you to understand his point that Okay, maybe the t economy's tough, maybe the younger generation has had a harder time getting jobs, but that doesn't mean you should skip college. Now let's talk about deductive reasoning, okay? Beginning with a premise and working to a conclusion which follows a logical path from the initial generalization, okay? Uh, in this case, the premise is the basis for the argument and the facts presented align with that premise leading to the final conclusion, okay? so. You have to basically start with assumption A, then go to assumption B, and eventually leads to conclusion C, okay? Because it integrates parts from A and B, okay? A basic form of deductive reasoning that I've just actually demonstrated here is what is called syllogism, okay? This is a very basic logical tool 
uh, that's been in existence pretty much since the dawn of logic itself with the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greek philosophers, okay? Uh, so uh, it basically runs like this. You have, a, you have two premises, and then your conclusion is based on combining those two premises. Uh, so let's say, for instance, uh, let's see. Uh, now, the hard part is, is trying to find one that actually works because the problem with syllogism is that it also has a tendency to generalize a lot. Okay? Uh, for instance, I will give you an example of a bad syllogism. Okay? Uh, there is a uh, joke out there about uh, Socrates getting into politics and using syllogism as part of his uh, campaigning. Uh, so the syllogism that he used for his campaign supposedly goes like this. Society should be run by the best class. I am middle class. Therefore, society should be run by the middle class. Okay? Basically saying, I'm in, I should be the one in charge. Okay? I'm going to show you some examples of syllogism here. Give me a minute. All right, so we have a few different... De uh, uh, subdivisions of syllogism. So we're going to take a look at uh, a brief example of uh, most of them here. So we have start off with a categorical syllogism. Okay, we have a couple examples of that. Here's here's what we're talking about. Major premise: all cars have wheels. The followed by the minor premise: I drive a car. Uh, conclusion: therefore, my car has wheels. Okay. Here's another one. Major premise: all insects frighten me. Minor premise, that is an insect. The conclusion, therefore, I am frightened. Okay? Uh, then we have the con conditional syllogism. Okay? So, you can write this one in one of two ways. You can either write it uh, like we did with the uh, categorical one. So, this one, so, the first example here would read, Katie is smart. Because she is smart, Katie will get good grades. Katie will get into a good college. Okay? So, you can shorten that into, if Katie is smart, then she will get into a good college. Uh, conditional syllogism requires a little bit of assumption uh, as we'll go along with it, okay? Uh, second one's kind of flawed logically. It says, if Richard likes Germany, then he must drive an Audi, okay? So, the major premise is, Richard likes Germany, and the minor premise is, Richard likes all German things. Therefore, the conclusion is, Richard drives a German car. Okay. Uh, the disjunctive syllogism uh, it says either A is or B is true. If it's A, B is false. Okay. So here we go. Uh, this cake is either red velvet or chocolate. It's not chocolate. Therefore, this cake is red velvet. Okay. Uh, second one's about the TV show Outlander. I don't watch that show. So, all right. You have the enthymeme. Okay, it's not one of the major types of syllogism, but what's known as a rhetorical one. Okay, these are often used in persuasive speeches or arguments. So this is the one that you're probably going to want to look at. Okay, these are also ones that could be highly flawed. They're going to admit, omit, a, you're going to omit a major or minor premise, assuming it's already accepted by the audience. Okay. Okay, for instance, he couldn't have stole the jewelry. I know him. So. Major premise is he couldn't have stolen the jewelry. The minor premise is I know his character. Uh, here's the second one. Her new purse can't be ugly. It's a Louis Vuitton. Okay? So the major premise is her new accessory can't be ugly. The minor premise is it's made by famous designer Louis Vuitton. Okay? Then we have the syllogistic fallacy, which is basically a flawed argument. Okay? Uh, one that uses a syllogism to oversimplify things. Okay? Uh, and includes a false presumption. For instance, all crows are black. The bird in my cage is black. Therefore, the bird is a crow. Do you know how many black birds there are out there? Okay, it's not necessarily a crow. Okay. The scenery in Ireland is beautiful. I am in Ireland. Therefore, the scenery must be beautiful. Somebody obviously has never been to Dublin. Okay. So, uh... That's basically the examples that I have for, for syllogism. It kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So as an example of deductive reasoning in a full argument setting as opposed to syllogism, uh, we have this excerpt from an author named Malcolm Gladwell. 
Uh, it's from a uh, article titled "Small Change: Why the Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted." Okay. Now he has some deductive reasoning going on in this excerpt, and a few assumptions that he makes. Okay. Uh, assumptions that I will admit to you, probably the last year or so, we have found that these assumptions are pretty much wrong. Okay. But this works at currently still as an example of deductive reasoning. Because at the time that he wrote it, it was assumed to be right. Okay, so let's take a look. The platforms of social media are built around weak ties. Twitter is a way of following or being followed by people you may never have met. Facebook is a tool for efficiently managing your acquaintances, for keeping up with the people you would not otherwise be able to stay in touch with. That's why you can have a thousand friends on Facebook as you never could in real life. This is in many ways a wonderful thing. There is strength in weak ties, as the sociologist Mark Granovetter has observed. But weak ties seldom lead to high-risk activism. Boycotts and sit-ins and nonviolent confrontations, which were the weapons of choice for the civil rights movement, are high-risk strategies. They leave little room for conflict and error. The moment even one protester deviates from the script and responds to provocation, the moral legitimacy of the entire protest is compromised. Enthusiasts for social media would no doubt have us believe that King's task in Birmingham would have been made infinitely easier had he been able to communicate with his followers through Facebook and contain himself with tweets from a Birmingham jail. But networks are messy. Think of the ceaseless pattern of correction and revision, amendment, and debate that characterizes Wikipedia. If Martin Luther King Jr. had tried to do a wiki boycott in Montgomery, he would have been steamrollered by the white power structure. And of what use would a digital communication tool be in a town where 98% of the black community could be reached every Sunday morning at church? The things that King needed in Birmingham, discipline and strategy, were things that online social media cannot provide. Okay? Uh, that's how he felt 10 years ago. Okay? I would venture a guess to say that with the events that have happened in the past 10 years, especially the rise of social media activism, I imagine that Gladwell's opinion might have changed by now, especially considering how effective some of these uh, activist programs have become on social media. Okay, so just think, just something to ponder here. Sometimes deductive reasoning doesn't keep up with fact. All right, so let's take a look at a uh, example here. We're going to talk about making a persuasive appeal. Okay. Uh, now we're going to have leave it to you guys to try to determine what type of appeal we're looking at. Okay, so uh, exercise number two on that chapter that we were just looking at. Okay, question presents two excerpts from argumentative essays and asks you to look for the different types of persuasive appeals in each. Okay, what I'd like you to do, this is also going to go to the discussion board. I want you to choose one of the excerpts and look for an individual type of appeal in your chosen excerpt. So look for ethos, pathos, or logos. Okay, uh, when you find it, uh, put down in your reply uh, where what part of the article you found it in, what part of the excerpt it was it was present at. Okay, so pretty much just directly quote the line where you found that appeal. So let's take a look at the two excerpts. Okay, uh, so the first one is from Susan Cain, an uh, excerpt from a book titled "Quiet: The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking." Okay. Today, introversion and extroversion are two of the most exhaustively researched subjects in personality psychology, arousing the curiosity of hundreds of scientists. These researchers have made exciting discoveries aided by the latest technology, but they're part of a long and storied tradition. Poets and philosophers have been thinking about introverts and extroverts since the dawn of recorded time. Both personality types appear in the Bible and in the writings of Greek and Roman physicians. And some evolutionary scientists say that the history of these types teaches back even farther than that. The animal kingdom also boasts introverts and extroverts, from fruit flies to pumpkin seed fish to rhesus monkeys. And with other complementary pairings, masculinity and femininity, east and west, liberal and conservative, humanity would be unrecognizable and vastly diminished without both personality types. Take the partnership of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr., a formidable orator refusing to give up his seat on a se refusing to give up his seat on a segregated bus wouldn't have had the same effect as a modest woman who'd clearly prefer to keep silent but for the exigencies of the situation. And Parks didn't have the stuff to thrill a crowd as she tried to stand up and announce that she had a dream. But with King's help, she didn't have to. 
Yet today, we make room for a remarkably narrow range of personality styles. We're told that to be great is to be bold, to be happy is to be sociable. We see ourselves as a nation of extroverts, which means that we've lost sight of who we really are. Depending on which study you consult, one-third to one-half of Americans are introverts. In other words, one out of every two or three people you know. If you're not an introvert yourself, you're surely raising, managing, married to, or coupled with one. All right, so let's go to the second one, okay? Uh, here is the second excerpt. This is from Robert Reich, uh, former Secretary of Labor. Uh, he has It's from his book, Super Capitalism, The Transformation of Business, Democracy, and Everyday Life, okay? Uh, Robert Reich has also become a very vocal uh, activist on social media. Uh, I actually uh, see him popping up in my Facebook feed all the time, okay? Uh, so here's what Robert Reich has to say. Walmart has become the poster child for all that's wrong with American capitalism because it replaced General Motors as the avatar of the economy. Recall that in the 1950s and the 1960s, GM earned more than any company on Earth and was America's largest employer. It paid its workers solidly middle-class wages with generous benefits, totaling around $60,000 a year in today's dollars. Today, Walmart, America's largest company by revenue and the nation's largest employer, pays its employees about $17,500 a year on average, or just under $10 an hour, and its fringe benefits are skimpy. No guaranteed pension and few, if any, health benefits. Now, Walmart does everything in its power to keep wages and benefits low. Internal memos in 2005 suggested hiring more part-time workers to lower the firm's health care enrollment and imposing wage caps on longer-term employees so they wouldn't be eligible for raises. Also, as I said earlier, Walmart is aggressively anti-union. Walmart's CEO in 2007 was H. Lee Scott Jr. Scott was no engine Charlie Wilson, who, as GM's talk of executive in the 1950s, saw no difference between the fate of the nation and the fate of his company. Scott had a far less grandiose view of Walmart's role. Some well-meaning critics believe that Walmart soars today because of our size should in fact play the role that is believed that General Motors played after World War II. And that is to establish this post-World War middle class that the country is proud of, he opined. The facts are that retail does not perform that role in this economy. Scott was right. The real problem, not of his making, is that almost nothing performs that role any longer. A rhetorical debate over Walmart is not nearly as interesting as the debate we might be having in our own heads if we acknowledge what was at stake. Millions of us shop at Walmart because we like its low prices. Many of us also own Walmart stock through our pension or mutual funds. Isn't Walmart really being excoriating for our sins? After all, it is not as if Walmart's founder, Sam Walton, and his successors created the world's largest retailer by putting a gun to our heads and forcing us to shop there or to invest any of our retirement savings in the firm. Okay, so take about five minutes or so, look through one of these excerpts, and uh, look for a specific appeal. Focus it on one of them. Ethos, pathos, logos. Okay? Uh, and Put in where you found that appeal in your chosen excerpt, okay? Uh, take five minutes to get you to post that.
we're back. So, uh, let's take a look at the actual assignment uh, for your first essay. Okay, so the first major essay assignment for this semester is going to be to create a classical argument. Okay, uh, I recommend doing this in your teams when we're face to face, but uh, since we're online, you can do this on your own. Uh, search for interesting topics and current events. Now, let me just make sure that we're clear here. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I want you guys to, to do in this class, uh, when I ask you to find subjects, because it's going to be because I want you to be working with current events. It's mainly because I want you guys to be aware of what's going on in the world and be able to critically think about events and form your own uh, takes on them. Okay? So... Search for interesting topics and current events. Good suggestion for this would be to look at news sites, such as newspapers and news networks, or internet news aggregators such as Yahoo News. So, I want you to find a single current events topic that you can work on. Okay? Something that lends itself to an argument. Read some information on the topic and choose an argument to make which aligns with your individual position on that topic. Focus on creating an argument to which there are agreeing and dissenting opinions. Okay, uh, one thing that we want to establish here is that you do not have to have an absolutely 100% ironclad thesis for your for any essay you write. A good thesis statement is going to leave room for dispute and argument and debate. Okay, so. We want to have something that has multiple sides where you can take one side and try to debate that side and persuade people that you're on the right side. Now, we will talk about what the classical argument contains in the next couple of weeks. But initially, what I want you to do is focus on your persuasive techniques and the facts which will support your argument. So as you're researching your subject, I want you to focus on what's going to prove your point, what kind of things you need to what kind of things you need to present, what kind of things you need to ration, rationalize and reason through in order for your audience to understand that you're right. Okay? Think about all those uh, logical appeals, logos, ethos, pathos. Think about your rhetorical situation. Who are you writing it for? Okay? What kind of person is it that you're expecting in your audience? So the base requirements for this essay... Uh, it should be three to five pages in length, okay? It should be double-spaced. It should be in 11 or 12-point font, okay? The font sizes, font faces, Arial, Times New Roman, or Calibri, okay? Uh, mainly because those are the three most standard uh, font, si font faces. Uh, I want an MLA format for things such as the name block should only go on the first page, and you should have page numbers with your last name that at, that advance with each page. This will need to also need an MLA format works cited and citations. Okay, works cited page for this is going to be required separate from the rest of the essay, which does not count toward the page count. You'll also need to cite your sources within the essay. Uh, you'll need MLA format for all citations and the works cited page. As far as the number of sources I want you to use, uh, I am going to require a minimum of four. Okay, so a minimum of four sources for this essay. Now, your classical argument must have a clear structure and thesis statement. We'll be talking about structure in the coming weeks. Your argument and position must be clear in addition to the attended audience for your argument. As much as possible, your argument must avoid any and all logical fallacies. For an overview of what to avoid, go to the site that's on this slide. Your logical fallacy is. Okay. Basically, I want you guys to format it in a. For, I want you guys to format this in a way where we can understand who your audience is, so that we can tell what your argument is, uh, what stance that you're taking, what your topic is, and any other elements that need to be taken into consideration, such as uh, information about your opposing viewpoint, uh, any kind of refutation of that opposing viewpoint, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, this assignment is going to be due on February 19th at midnight on eCampus. That is a Friday. Okay. I'm going to have two workshop weeks for this essay. 
Uh, first one is going to be the week of February 8th, which is the revision workshop. Uh, we're going to, if you've taken my 1301, you know what I mean by this. This is going to be a revision draft where we're looking at what's presented, the quality of the argument, the quality of the sources, the quality of the uh, stuff that's cited from those sources, and you're basically looking at how well it's written, how readable it is, okay, how easy it is to understand. Then the next week, week of February 15th, which is also the week it's due, that's the proofreading and editing workshop. So you're going to be uh, working with your teammates to uh, fix any mechanical issues. This involves grammar, spelling, mechanics. Uh, this would include things such as paragraph breaks. Let me, let me repeat that paragraph breaks because I know a lot of people have a tendency to write everything as a single paragraph, okay? Uh, but you need to be aware that the week that it's due, you're going to be doing workshopping for proofreading issues, okay? Uh, so basically, that's what you have to look forward to on this. Again, it's work we're working to uh, uh, turn this in on the 19th of February. All right, and that'll do it for this week. Uh, so get, go ahead and get started looking through uh, the, the news and trying to find yourself a topic for this. Uh, of course, there will be another, uh, there is another discussion topic that you'll need to respond to. Uh, and with all that being said, uh, I'll also work on MindTap. Uh, continue working on that as much as you can. Uh, with that being said, uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you guys next week.